This is a presentation from the local Cardano community event for the Cardano Summit this year here in Brisbane, Australia. We've had a lot of experts come in and present their projects or present their expertise within the crypto and NFT space at this event. And Dr. Adrian McCullen is definitely one of our uh, regulars that comes every single month and contributes so much to our little community here in Brisbane. Well, when I say little, it's growing quite quite uh, well at the moment. Now, this presentation is about a novel use of NFTs and recent legal cases on NFTs uh, around the world. And he presents some really cool, interesting stories about it. And I thought I'll cut this one out from that really long live stream. And this was one that I thought I'd like to highlight. I'll cut the other ones up soon. So if you're interested in watching all these little segments, please make sure you subscribe to the channel. Now, let's get into this one. Yeah, yeah, gotta do it like that. You've been listening to the Learn Cardano podcast. Gotta get it hype. Crypto is what we like. But this is not investment or financial advice. Gotta do your research, cause it's risky. We know it is. This show is educational and it's informative. Crypto's the future, really, it ain't no debate. Okay, I'm gonna start straight away. Um, my name's Adrian McCullough. Um, uh, I'm a lawyer and you'll soon find out why. Um, here's my disclaimer. Everything I say could be rubbish. Okay? I take no responsibility for errors that may exist in this paper and certainly take no responsibility if you want to go do something based on this paper, um, go get proper legal advice. Okay, what I'm going to talk about is give an NFT overview from a legal perspective, some legal aspects of NFTs, some use of NFTs which is becoming, um, I'll say popular, but there's been a couple of really interesting cases dealing with ransomware attacks um, and the issue of substituted service. There's a court order in the United States. Um, the law firm, they were, this is the very first law firm that used an NFT as a substituted service mechanism in a ransomware attack. Um, Holland and Knight out of Florida. Um, I know. Uh, one of the lead lawyers in that case. And the UK has um, followed suit with their aspects. Okay, I don't need to teach you guys what an NFT, it's a digital representation of some unique asset. It's the uniqueness that is important. When we talk about fungible, one Bitcoin is the same as every other Bitcoin. One Ether is the same as every other Ether, but that's not the case when it comes to NFTs. Um, they are unique. Um, when you, I hope everyone here knows what a Drysdale painting is, um, and if you swap it for a McCutcheon, you're actually getting a totally different asset. Okay? They're not interchangeable per se. Um, think of a birth certificate. It's unique. Okay? At law... Each piece of art, and there's a, there's a high court case where Justice Menzies spoke about this dealing with a piece of art, um, you can't substitute one piece of art for another piece of art. That's why NFTs have become very popular in the digital art framework, very popular. Um, ticketing is another area which is becoming very popular with NFTs, especially if you have allocated seating. Each seat is unique to the next seat. So when we talk land registry is another. Um, now the beauty of having uniqueness is that at law, if you have a piece of asset that is unique, you can actually get the equitable remedy of specific performance. So if I was going to buy a piece of art from Peter, um, digital art even, um, and I didn't pay on time, he could get a, what, an injunction on, it's called a mandatory injunction, um, of getting um, specific performance in respect to that piece of uh, art. Whereas if it's a uh, non-unique, then at most he'll get damages. So he doesn't actually get the, action, get the property, he'll get damages as a replacement. It. But when it comes to uniqueness, you get this special aspect of um, specific performance. Now, from a technical perspective, NFT comprises a smart contract. You notice I say intimately connected. 
The reason I use that word intimately connected is that there are blockchains out there where you don't have to embed the code inside a block. In Ethereum, you do. It sits inside a block, so therefore it becomes immutable. That code becomes immutable, and that creates a whole heap of issues if you have variations in contracts. How do you vary a smart contract that's written in Solidity on a Ethereum blockchain? It becomes very hard. Um, now, this code um, can emu emulate specific performance. So the code itself can do exactly what the court order is going to do if it is an NFT of uniqueness. So it can actually force the action of the transfer and all of the payment mechanisms automatically. So you don't have to go to court. So it becomes a very um, uh, easy process and a much cheaper process because you, you can circumvent the court process. Now, when I say circumvent the court process, there's actually um, a public policy aspect that you, you, you cannot oust the court's jurisdiction. But if you write your smart contract code correctly, and it becomes this, when we talk about smart contract code, there's basically uh, three ways you can do it. You can have an illegal smart contract. Tornado, tornado cash is now regarded as illegal smart contract. Humblers, if you look at the United States. Interesting, I get on to, I'll talk about that, I'm jumping ahead. You have legal smart contract code. That is smart contract code that complies with all aspects of the law. Then you have smart legal contract code. Smart legal contract code is where you have a contract that's written in deterministic language that can be converted into deterministic code on a blockchain, right? And I'm not going to go into the technical aspects of that. It's outside the what we're really talking about. So specific performance is a discretionary equitable remedy. But you can get, there are cases um, all the way up to the High Court in Australia that has said that if the parties agree that specific performance will be part of the remedies, then that consent alone will make, even if it's not a unique asset, if that is so important to the parties, then they will do, they will grant a specific performance um, uh, injunction in there. So it's arguable that NFT code that includes specific performance code would meet that requirement. So when we talk about buying an NFT, it doesn't mean that we actually acquire the copyright or the intellectual property to that product. Think about buying a book, okay? Um, person possesses the physical item of the book, and that becomes what's called a rivalrous asset. A rivalrous asset basically means, here's a chair, I have possession of it, it means no one else can have possession of it while I've got possession of it. It's rivalrous to itself. Intellectual property, or in, in what we call in law, in Incorporeal, no body, um, intangible assets are generally non rivalrous assets. These are economic terms. Now, when we talk about um, owning something, we then have to go to um, Professor Tony Honore from Oxford University identified what the 11 indicia of ownership actually means. And it's been accepted in Australia. There's a case called Yana, um, which is a High Court case where Justice Mason makes reference to Turner Honoré's um, 11 indicia. At law, we call these the bundle of rights things. So we have a right to control the book. So I could have the right to control the NFT. The right to destroy, but there are subject limitations on that. I own a house. I can't burn down that house, OK? But I can get, a, I can get a, an application to the council to actually destroy a house if I'm going to build another house in replacement. So there are ways of getting over these things, but there's a set of rules that still apply. A right to transfer or sell the book. That's what an NFT will allow you to do. You can sell or transfer that asset. So the same legal position arises for NFTs. Unless the owner of the copyright, and you have to be, we were talking about, um, uh, earlier about algorithmic generation of um, an NFT, um, there'd be no copyright in that resulting 
a piece of art. The reason for that is that you have to have what's called an, um, uh, an eligible person under the Copyright Act, and that has to be a human being. And there's been court cases on that. Um, Telstra lost a very large database case because they were using automated um, collection of information um, and they couldn't show who the eligible person was who actually collected that information to actually put it in the database in order to get protection. So um, that doesn't mean that the software that generated won't have copyright, but the results of the copyrighted application, oh sorry, of the software that generated the application will not have copyright attached to it. So the advantage of entity is that, it's in, that it is possible to ensure that all future sales, and this is really important, like the Beeple um, work that was sold for $69 million, I think, plus Christie's fee, which I think is about 15, 20%. So Christie's did very well on a digital art work that day. Now, under the Copyright Act, um, a number of years ago, the Copyright Act was changed so that you can have downstream fees being paid to the original author. One of the big areas was dealing with um, actually Aboriginal art, that the Aboriginal, uh, the Indigenous Australian will sell the work, but they only get the fee up front, and that's it. Now the Copyright Act says you have downstream, and they'll get a small percentage of every downstream sale for that original author. The same can be done with um, smart contracts and NFTs. But here's the interesting issue. Under the Copyright Act, that downstream fee is only payable while the author is alive. It's a bit like moral rights under the Copyright Act. How does a smart contract deal with that? Does it need to go out to an oracle like the deaths registry and see whether that transaction should be paid, that small fee, so let's say, and I'm not wishing people to be dead, but let's say in five years' times he did die, right? but there are three transactions in the intervening, he'll get a fee for each of those three transactions. On the fourth one, after he's died, his estate doesn't get anything at law. But the smart contract may still do that. How long does it go for? Forever? So these, these are issues at law on dealing with NFTs that are arising. So ransomware attacks. We all know what a ransomware attack is. We also know that um, a lot of these criminals are using things like Monero, Dash, Zcash, because they have very strong privacy and anonymity characteristics to those particular coins. Um, in Europe, the European Par uh, Commission and Parliament is going to outlaw um, Monero Dash and Zcash because of that. Okay? Just outlaw it. If you use it, you're breaking the law. Simple as that. That's what they're going to do. Um, so Monero allows for truly anonymous transactions. And it's a bit like the use of Tornado Cash. Um, Tornado, Tornado Cash in the United States, because of FinCEN, which is the equivalent of our Austrac, has actually made that an illegal mechanism. Okay? Now, Tornado Cash is just another smart contract, and it would fit within an illegal smart contract. Okay? So you just need to... And here's the real crux of this. They haven't admitted it, and this is just my suspicion, but one of the principal coders of Tornado Cash was living in the Netherlands. He is currently under arrest. Now, should that be correct? Now, Tornado Cash can be used for legal reasons. It can also be used as a tumbler of trying to um, increase the anonymity and the tracing and making it hard for law enforcement who have to monitor money laundering, counterterrorism, financing aspects. So just because you have a piece of software that can be used for illegal purposes, should the coder of that software be held accountable, and it can be used for legal purposes. To me, that is similarly saying, I'm going to now arrest 
the directors of Ford and GMH because the cars that they build, yes, they can be used for legitimate reasons, but they can be used for illegitimate or illegal reasons as well. It doesn't make sense. Okay, I don't think I think that the arrest of that um, coder um, is wrong, totally wrong. But I'm not the coder, and I'm not sitting in a prison in the Netherlands, so it's easy for me to say those things. So, um, one of the things that we do find is that if they if um, uh, ransomware thieves or or however you want to call them, um, do use Monero, the Dash, uh, Zcash. Um, they eventually need to liquidate that payment. The li liquidity rate of those three digital coins is really low. So what they do is they generally convert to Bitcoin, Ether, high liquidity assets. Then that's where um, that's when law enforcement actually follows them correctly, right down to the very end. So what's actually happening is that, um, like Chainalysis, the um, uh, forensic uh, blockchain group, they were engaged to monitor. A particular LCX is the case. It's at the bottom of here. What happened in that case was that, and I'll just flip over. Um, they're a digital currency exchange based in Liechtenstein. They claim their system had been hacked and that there was eight million uh, dollar, US dollars worth of digital assets taken. All the digital assets were based on the Ethereum blockchain. They didn't use Monero, Zcash. Um, there were 20, they, I don't know how they knew this, but they actually calculated there were 25 people involved in the ransomware attack. Okay. The investigation um, by LCX had shown that the stolen assets were converted into USDC. USDC, um, stable coin run by Circle out of New York. Um, uh, which is a Jeremy Allaire. Interesting, Jeremy Allaire was one of the founders of Cold Fusion. The Allaire brothers um, wrote Cold Fusion back in the early 80s. It might have been late 80s. Uh, it's a stable coin by Circle, and it's... Now, USDC is a digital token that's fully backed by the equivalent amount of US dollars. Um, USDT is not. Um, there's a lot of issues. I know that um, the SEC, for instance, is making a number of inroads or investigations into USDT as we speak. Um, but USDC does have um, a fully backed uh, assets. USDC is a major stable coin that's traded on a number. I think it's the second largest. Um, it's behind USDT in value. It's probably got about $57 billion um, in assets that have been issued. So, the holders of USDC can only redeem their USDC into fiat if they hold a circle account. That's an important point. So, we're trying to trace the people that hold this particular um, piece of digital asset. So, um, the, the law firm that did this is Holland and Knight out of um, uh, Florida. Uh, I know one of the partners there. Now, pursuant to Clause 13 of um, the Terms and Conditions, Circle reserves the right to block certain USDC addresses, and if such addresses are Circle cust custodial addresses, um, they can freeze accounts, but they only freeze it if they have a court order. So even though they knew, well, Circle knew who these people were because they had to do the KYC and a whole heap of other things. They weren't willing to give it to LCX or Holland and Knight at that point in time. So Holland and Knight came up with a very, very unique approach, knowing that they didn't know who these people were. When you bring your action, in the United States they call it um, John Doe, 
right, you can bring a John Doe action. In the United Kingdom, it's called peace, persons unknown, right? But it's the same type of mechanism. And in Australia, it's usually called persons unknown as well. So this is what they did. They went to court and uh, they established to the court's satisfaction that even though they didn't know who the people were, they could still serve them. And the way they served them is they did an airdrop of the court documents <laughs> on the address where the USDC was sitting. So you go to this judge, right, and I feel sorry for judges because the poor schmucks have no idea about A, what a crypto is, right, and B. And so you're up there and you're explaining that, well, Your Honour, um, they have this... Uh, intangible piece of property that's worth about $8 million, yes, and um, we don't know who they are, yes, but we know how to serve them. How do you know how to serve them if you don't know who they are? If you know who they are, just send out a, a private investigator and go get them. Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that, Your Honour. Um, they have a set of private keys and public key addresses that sit on a blockchain, and we could grab your order if you're willing to give it to us as a substituted service mechanism and we'll convert that into an NFT and we will do an airdrop. What's an airdrop? Oh, well, an airdrop, right? You've got all of these issues. So, you know, you, you explain it. The, the, young, the ladies that were talking about get rid of the jargon, that's what they did. They explained it in very simple terms and said, we're going to digitize this thing. And what they really did is they just converted the thing into a PDF and said, here you are, this is digitized, okay? Now we're going to convert that into an NFT. We know the address. We know that they want to convert those USDCs into something else, but we need a court order against Circle to stop the any disbursements. Then they said, so, that, so the judge actually asked them, so they actually stole um, USDC. Uh, no, Your Honour. Unfortunately, they took Ether. What's Ether? Well, that's a digital coin on a, plop, on a blockchain. Oh, okay. Why are you after the USDC? Oh, I went, to, went through what's called a tumbler. What's a tumbler? Well, Your Honour, there's a thing called Tornado Cash. Tornado Cash jumbles things up, these digital assets, so as to make it more difficult for law enforcement agencies to follow the assets so that at the end they may have put in Ether, but they got USDC out at the other end. Now, they might not, and they can choose what asset they want at the other end, okay? So they may have wanted to get Ether again, but it'd have a different public key address attached to it and you can get your um, private key. Anyway. They convinced the judge that this was okay. And this is the first case anywhere in the world for substituted service of a court documents using an NFT. So, you know, Tornado Cash uses smart contracts to accept token deposits from one address and enables them to withdraw from different addresses. Okay? So they convinced the judge that this was okay. I've been talking to, okay, I've been talking to the partner at um, Holland and Knight, you're not going to believe this. One of the 25, when, when you get court, court documents, right, you have to, if you don't want to get a default judgment, you have to put in an appearance. And I said to him, you're not going to get anyone putting in an appearance because they've, they've, they've done illegal work. He said one of the people has challenged the jurisdiction and put in what's called a conditional appearance. So now they know exactly who the person is. Now, here's the other thing. The lawyer for the defendant has sought a court order to hide his identity. <laughs> and the court has struck that down. No, we're not going to do that, right? If he, I don't mind him challenging, but he's got to tell us who he is. So, so we've got this um, 
Uh, tornado cash, and on the 8th of August, the Treasury Department, what's called the Foreign Asset Control, um, sanctioned virtual currency mixer. I don't know the end result of this, but what I'm getting across is that here's a very unique use of an NFT to serve court documents under a substituted service because the court documents will be a unique asset. Right? So, here's the other one. Now, obviously, um, with Tornado Cash, there's a, there's a think tank, very respected think tank called the Coin Centre. Um, I know Peter van um, Valkenburg. Um, OFA, and they've, they've actually um, challenged and brought a court action against OFAC saying that they don't have jurisdiction to ban Tornado Cash. Why? Because when you read the legislation, the rights of OFAC can only be against legal entities. Tornado Cash is a program. All right? So this becomes a very, that's why I say, look, don't believe everything I'm saying. Tomorrow it could be all changed. Now, unfortunately, as I've pointed out in red here, um, the Netherlands a software developer who assists in developing the Tornado has been arrested and he's still sitting in prison. Um, I don't know why they chose him, uh, but I suspect that the OFAC had something to do with it, talking at government to government level. So I've gone over that slide. I've only got a few minutes left. So Holland and Knight, I've spoken to them. And uh, I think that um, uh, LCX will win that case. Um, they will get their court order and they will get their assets back. Um, now, the UK has done nearly the same thing. Now, the reason I point out these two cases, number one, in Australian jurisprudence, courts um, are not bound by what occurs in the United States or what occurs in the United Kingdom. But they can have very strong persuasive value if the reasoning and the ju jurisprudential aspects are equally applicable to Australia. You're going to find in Australia um, a lot of the patent cases, and I think you'll find the crypto cases when they come, will be looking towards the actions of what the courts in the United States and the United Kingdom are saying. So. On 22 June, the UK High Court issued exactly the same judgment, in effect. Now, the beauty of this judgment is that Justice Tower um, gave an extensive analysis of what's called Lex Citus. Lex Citus says, um, what is the law of the jurisdiction that can cover this like a governing law, but this is um, lex, lex meaning, you know, lex citus is very easy to understand the Latin of that, okay? Um, so he gave a very good analysis um, in that judgment as to why the UK court had jurisdiction to and give the, excuse me, there's no yawning over here. We do not allow yawning. Okay, so the case is um, Daolia. Um, he was a resident in the UK and he claims that through some fraudulent activity, um, 2.1 million of, it was a combination, it's about 1.2 and I think it's uh, 900,000 um, US dollars of USDC and USDT illegally acquired by persons unknown. Um, the court uh, basically identified a number of questions whether the court should grant permission to serve outside the jurisdiction. Again, there are a number of um, people involved. <laughs> this is where they were located, according to um, their forensic. Panama, Caymans Island, Seychelles and Thailand. Um, the location of the first event was totally unknown. Okay, I'm going to, I'm finishing right away. God, he's mean to me. Huh? Yeah, I mean, really. Oh. You are so rude. Okay, the case has substantial ramifications, especially in ransomware cases. Um, it does give a leg up to people who have been subject to ransomware attacks. Um, uh, the concepts noted in the New York case and UK case um, are likely to be followed persuasively in Australia. 
Um, the fundamental position in the case is to explain to the court that even though the identity of the defendants remain unknown, the defendants need to gain access to the public key address and as such an airdrop of court documents and supporting documentation to that public key address will bring to the defendant's attention the court action from a service perspective. Okay, I'm on the last slide. Are you happy? Are you happy? Okay, um, non-fungible uh, digital assets um, that are property at law, um, and I didn't go into that why they're property, but if you want to read 547 pages from the um, UK and Wales Law Reform Commission um, that was published on the 20th of July this year, it'll tell you why it's property. Okay, um, smart contracts that represent unique assets, that's what NFTs are, um, they're non-fungible. Um, they're non-transferable tokens can be used to contribute to, you can make them non-transferable too, okay, which is, really, which is what you want to stop scalping in respect of tickets, okay? So you can have a non-fungible that's non-transferable as well. And because the smart contract, you can put a time limit on it so it dies once the concert is over. So there's some advantages of it. Lawyers um, need to be careful if they decide to issue NFTs to cover the delivery of future legal services. Um, court documents are obviously unique in their uses, and as such, these two international cases have involved service of court documents by a substituted service. Thank you. Now, if you guys want to follow Adrian and to understand what else he talks about in the legal space, links are down below for you for his LinkedIn profile. So you can follow him and see exactly what he's talking about or the legal cases that he's working on uh, or the legal sphere that he's working on in general. Now, if you like this type of content, if you want more of these snippets and uh, shorter segments from the Cardano Summit here in Brisbane, please let me know down in the comments below. Otherwise, please consider giving me that thumbs up, click subscribe button and click on that notification bell and you hear more awesome Kadana related content from me soon. I'll see you in the next video. Yeah, yeah, gotta do it like that. You've been listening to the Learn Cardano podcast. Gotta get it hype. Crypto is what we like. But this is not investment or financial advice. Gotta do your research, cause it's risky. We know it is. This show is educational and it's informative. Crypto's the future, really, it ain't no debate.